we uh, we try really hard to uh, to aim high, and then uh, and then be okay with uh, with any level of result that we generate against our objectives, provided we're making incremental steps forward. And that's I, I think the real the real magic. If you always are making steps forward in your business, eventually you end up being the next huge business in the world, right? Uh, it's the steps backwards that uh, that really set you back. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammond. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Thanks for tuning in here to Growth Think Tank. Really excited about sharing this with you. And before you run, I have done so many interviews in the last few weeks. I have such a, an exciting time to share with you that those interviews have been organized into the 12 core principles of fast growth companies. So all you have to do to get that is go to genehammett.com slash worksheet. So you can get the 12 principles and I've been able to uh, go in there and find which episodes will align to each individual episode. When you subscribe to Growth Think Tank, you will find exactly what you need so that you can move forward. And many of them haven't been published yet, depending on when you're hearing this, but you can, you can tune in to the date that means the most to you. Is your company growing really fast? then you know the pressure you have around communication, around meeting structure, and around having maybe too many meetings or not enough meetings, and everyone doesn't seem to be aligned if you're growing at this astronomical pace. Well, I wanted to figure out how other companies were doing this. So I went out there and found the company that I really admire, a company called Skills. Skills was number one on the fastest place to grow in 2017. That growth rate was 50,000 plus percent over a three-year period in the millions of dollars. And are you wondering to yourself, how did they do it? Well, the interesting part of this is they've adopted what's traditionally a, a technology methodology called Agile versus Waterfall. And this Agile has been something that they've adopted for the entire company, all the way from um product mar uh, management to customer service to communications to every aspect of the business runs through the agile methodology. And I'm with Andrew Paradise, the co-founder there at Skills, talking about exactly how they do that, why they do it, and all of that is inside today's interview. So stay tuned for an amazing conversation with Andrew Paradise, co-founder of Skills. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm doing well today. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, you know, I've already let our audience know a little bit about skills and, and from a highest level, uh, number one fastest growing company in 2017 on the Inc. list. Uh, very impressive feat, over 50,000%, which for many people will probably think that's insane. Um, can you give us a little background about skills and like, you know, this whole market that you're in? Sure. So skills is driving the future of entertainment by accelerating the convergence of sports, video games, and media into the first mobile esports platform. So what our platform does is we enable mobile game developers to uh, put a piece of software inside of their games that they then distribute to consumers all over the world to play in their games. And that piece of software enables competitive multiplayer tournaments. Uh, we are best known for, for our fairness and for a, a number of core backend technologies that enable a fair competitive gaming experience. So one of our claims to fame is we actually police and stop all of the cheating in the ecosystem, providing a fair, fun, and meaningful competition platform for uh, now 18 million plus consumers. So this mobile gaming thing, we all have kids. I play a game every once in a while. Um, not very much, but, but this is a really growing market. Where, where do you see it going from here? Well, we start off in the mobile gaming space. It was uh, it was eight billion dollars in terms of the entire uh, sector, and that was in two thousand eleven. Um, it's grown the, to this past year to sixty three billion dollars, and actually became the majority of the entire gaming ecosystem. So, mobile passed uh, computer and console gaming. Um, the projections are that it will continue to trend that way. So, mobile gaming has grown at uh, thirty five percent Kager. Uh, over the last six years versus computer and console is growing at more like eight to 10. Uh, and mobile is projected to be a $150 billion industry. So mobile gaming, $150 billion industry by 2025, uh, more than half of the entire gaming uh, ecosystem. And gaming is projected to be 
uh, continuing to eat away at other forms of entertainment. Sometimes we like to joke and call it inactive entertainment, but you may know it better as, uh, as video or television. Inactive entertainment. Okay. Um, how many employees do you have? Uh, we're about 230 employees, although we're, we're growing about, uh, about 20 a month. So it's a little hard to keep track of. Well, that is a lot of employees. And I know, you know, to keep up the demand of the market, the, the business is growing. You've got some interesting ways at which you guys do business. It's, it's, it's not traditional the way you guys organize around meetings and, and organize around the work that you have. So give us an idea of kind of the foundational idea of, of your, how you work together. Sure. Well, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, so maybe to start there, and, uh, and I've been a, uh, an inventor in, uh, in five different sectors for technology. Um, my first company was an image recognition company. Uh, we, only, we got to about 12 employees uh, before we sold the company. Uh, my second company uh, invented mobile self-checkout, so mobile payments using your phone in stores. Um, that company got to a little bit under 50 employees uh, before we sold it. And my current company, I think I mentioned a moment ago, is uh, over 200. And so the way we work is actually a big part of the experiment, I think, for any company. Uh, and particularly with ours, um, uh, across each of these companies, uh, we tried implementing various levels of agile uh, engineering methodology into the company. And for those of uh, you viewers who aren't familiar, agile is uh, this uh, concept of going, moving away from sort of a, a, what was traditionally referred to as a waterfall method of engineering which is we kind of do a lot of defining up front of what we're going to do for work. We then do a working period with a set deadline. And then someday soon we have this finished piece of software and we ship it off to the world. And that's the end of it. We're kind of done with that work. And then we go back to planning. We do this big, huge, long planning session, and then do another cycle of work and we ship it off to the world. And so Agile is uh, really this concept around modern software development where Instead of um, having huge planning sessions and then shipping, uh, what we do is we actually do very bite-sized, almost micro levels of planning. And then we're very quickly shipping, building, iterating. And so if you ask me what software the team will be working on three months from now, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we candidly don't know. Uh, what we do know is here's a, like a backlog of ideas and things that we'd like to work on given a, kind of our, our best moment in time right now. And so when you think about translating that into a work uh, place, and I apologize if I'm going on too long here, but I, I feel like it, this is important. The um, first company, we had Agile just for engineering. The second company, product development. So half the company ran Agile. And then uh, again, there, there's still a lot of friction. And then this company, Skills, we're running Agile in every team, including business teams. And so, uh, you know, maybe quote like Facebook uh, is often famous for saying, move that, move fast and break things. Uh, we definitely do that in all teams here, particularly in our, in our business teams. So the way that works in terms of a week overflow, or what, sorry, a week flow, um, you have your planning cycle or your sprint planning as it's called at the beginning of the week, that's your Monday, and you're planning out what your work is for the week. We then have a 15 minute stand up every day of the week for everyone uh, on every team. So you might be in the communications team. I'm with them right now here with you today. Uh, they're going to stand up uh, tomorrow morning. They're going to talk about three things and in no less than 15 minutes, kind of walking around the table. And those three things are, what did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? And what are my problems or what's blocking me? And everyone on the team quickly does that. And that allows you to remove bottlenecks from your workflows and to really coordinate what the activities for a day will be. Um, and ideally, what I'm doing yesterday and what I'm doing today relates back to that work plan that you created on, uh, on the Monday morning. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. I want to stop right here for a second. Move fast and break things. That's showed up a lot inside of these conversations. I've had interviews, but I want to highlight this in case you didn't see the other episodes. It comes from uh, Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg really believed that in the early days of them growing the Facebook platform, them getting to a billion users, that they had to move fast and break things. They didn't want people to not take risk. They wanted to always be uh, testing. And they wanted to always be really pushing the boundaries and finding the edge. And the whole culture centered around this concept of move fast and break things. Now, your culture may call it something different, but if you believe in failure, if you embrace that, and you have these open, honest uh, 
conversations and transparency around that. You really can create a place where people are failing forward and they really are moving fast and you will have a kind of a fast moving company as well. Now back to the interview with Andrew. I want to bring everybody to speed on this. Like we've done waterfall for decades, right? This, this was something that started way back into, you know, build a house is typically a waterfall kind of thing. And a lot of it is because technology didn't allow for the speed at which it does today because it was, you know, when you ship software, you shipped it in boxes back. And, and when I first started uh, doing computers, I know you're a little younger than I am, um, but, but you, guys, you guys were able to see the changes in technology and now you have this, this way of shipping these, these small drops of code and iteratively improving it. Am I got that correct? That's right. And then, and then think about that relationship of that first, that week though to say the overall quarter. So let's like describe the rest of the quarter because I think it's really important uh, in terms of how you iterate towards what you call release in Agile. Uh, in our case, um, you know, back to the communications team, they did that one uh, week of work. They then are going to plan a sprint the next week and the relationship from week to week on their work ties into an overall planning process that we, uh, we actually adapted from, uh, from Google uh, who is known as the inventor of the OKR system or objective and key result system. And the OKR operating system is like an overall backbone for the company where each team is going to plan out uh, its three to five objectives and then three to five key, uh, key results. And if any of your viewers or, or readers are interested in learning more about that, a quick uh, Google of OKR and you can actually see a number of different sites that are great at helping, plan, helping you plan OKRs against your business. I, I can't, uh, recommend it enough as a great way to business plan quarter to quarter because it gives you uh, the direction you need for building a startup, but it also keeps everyone accountable while uh, I would say I'll call it loose accountability. And what I mean by that is a great OKR, so a, a great objective and key result is uh, a number or set of numbers tying back to an objective that you're looking to hit somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of. And the process, the reason is 60 to 70% is, is you're sort of going for like a C-level execution on uh, a few different numbers. Um, it gives you the flexibility to aim really high while it uh, gives you the accountability where you can make progress without having to hit the number completely and still feel good about moving the business forward. One of the things that skills uh, as a culture is, is really big on is this concept of, um, of failing upwards. And so we, uh, we try really hard to, uh, to aim high and then, uh, and then be okay with, uh, with any level of result that we generate against our objectives, provided we're making incremental steps forward. And that's, I, I think, the real, the real magic. If you always are making steps forward in your business, eventually you end up being the next huge business in the world, right? Uh, it's the steps backwards that, uh, that really set you back. You know, it's a very common uh, conversation inside of fast growing companies, you guys being, you know, astronomical in 2017 and continuing that now is to have a different relationship with failure. You know, a lot of companies resist failure. Like they, they, they end up moving slow because they are so careful. Why has it really proven you uh, to work for you guys? I think the thing we try to teach at skills is that, Communication is the most important aspect of doing business, and you can't have uh, true communication if you don't build uh, trust and transparency around failure. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, well, everyone loves to say the great news when it comes through. No one wants to say the bad news. And if you can't build into your culture and uh, acceptance of it's okay to fail as long as you learn from it, I think you end up in a, a situation where uh, people are uh, almost uh, trained into hiding failure over time. And so it really, it all starts from the top. It starts from like me saying, hey, I'm totally fine with you failing. I just want to know early and often that it's happening. Uh, we like to say this uh, three-part statement often in skills. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one, if something's going wrong, you're going to hear about it from me first. Um, two, I'm going to demonstrate that I care more than you do. And three, I'm going to demonstrate that I'm all over it. And I think if you have that kind of um, ownership within a company or around a, an effort, let's even say beyond a company, but around a mission, 
uh, you end up having uh, a group of people where not only is failure acceptable, but uh, failure has the right process. Transparency. Wow, that's such a big word, right? It's tossed around a lot. And, and many people, they think they have a level of transparency, but I want to really urge you to think about the level of transparency you have. So what exactly is it? Well, in, in traditional sense, transparency means openness, or it's really about you know trust, and it's about sharing what's really on your mind. Now, are you sharing everything that you can to your team? Do you trust them enough to share everything? Now, you may be thinking to yourself, like, well, you know, I can't share everything. I have done the research and looked at a lot of companies going fast just like this. And I work with teams to help them you know, reduce that fear of transparency because it really does hold you back. I work with leaders to really grow beyond just the need to hold on and control and to open up. And if you have any questions about how to do that, I would love to talk to you about that. Just reach out to me, gene at genehammett.com. Now back to the interview with Andrew. Where did you get those three from? Is it something you guys came up together as you were developing the teams? Um, my, uh, my life partner, she uh, is smarter and better than me at everything. Okay. <laughs> um, I speak on stages around the importance of getting employees to go beyond responsibility to take ownership. And those three pieces in there really are kind of a, a great way to talk about that level of ownership. Go through them again. And, and, and let's break it down a little bit. The first one was about, um, you'll hear from me first. So sure. what, what does that mean and how does that work? <clears throat> one, if something's going wrong, you'll hear about from me first. Two, I'm going to demonstrate to you that I care more about it than you do. And three, I'm going to demonstrate that I'm all over it. That is really impressive. If you had employees that do that, and I'm sure you guys do, um, it really does change the way things happen. Yeah, it does. And in fact, we, uh, we actually run that kind of methodology across every level of the company, even in, in how our board works with me. So uh, I, I think everything has to start from the top. And, uh, and so we run the exact same processes in terms of agile, in terms of uh, failure and our commitment to communication at every level of the company. And that, that, if there's one thing I had to say has generated the results that Skills has had, it's, it's much more about our operating system and methodology than it is about the industry or any other aspect of the business. Well, I want to go back into this whole agile planning because the details behind it, I think, are really kind of interesting because a lot of companies will say, man, what you listed out there, Andrew, that's a lot of meetings. You have all these little small 15-minute meetings. Like, do you guys ever get any work done? Um, so what do you say to that? Well, a couple of things. One is, uh, I would much rather only make one step forward a day, provided I know I'm walking in the right direction, uh, than walk all day. True. Um, that'd be, that'd be you talk a lot about direction and I, I've been playing with this thought. So I'm going to kind of bounce it off you being, being at the level you are and growing as fast as you are. Employees that need to be delegated to. I mean, we get it. We hear, we hear about delegation all the time, but really I feel like employees really just need direction and the level of trust from our leaders like you, that they're going to know how to get things done and, and, and engage resources when necessary. So direction becomes much more important than the whole delegation piece. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the, the words we use in, in, in terms of management, whether it's delegation or, uh, or direction, um, Assigning responsibility has to go hand in hand with authority. And what I mean by that is uh, one of the things we, we focus a lot on here at Skills, and I'll give an example of uh, prepping to decide to do this interview. Um, our head of communications owns all communications for Skills. And owning all communications for Skills, uh, she decides whether or not I'm going to be on this interview, not me. And <laughs> That's like a really interesting thing, right? I, I'm the CEO. You'd be like, oh, of course Andrew decides who gets to do the interviews. It's like, no, actually, Maureen is tasked with growing uh, skills communications. Therefore, she owns it and she decides who's the best speaker, what kinds of talking points they should be prepped with, kind of every element of not just strategy, but execution. And I, I think that's a, a, maybe a little bit different from how some companies uh, look to operate. And it is certainly, it's scary, right? It's scary saying, hey, I'm going to turn over every aspect of communications to this person and they're going to choose how everything runs um, at skills. 
I think at the end of the day, though, to build a really powerful company, you have to uh, give up control and you have to say, okay, I'm going to hire people who are smarter than me. Uh, and not only are they going to be smarter than me, I'm going to actually believe that at a holistic level where I'm going to give them co total control over certain elements of the business. Uh, I like to say often the statement, uh, I'm just trying to work myself out to the beach. Um, <laughs> And what I mean by that is uh, if we do everything right, uh, ideally at some point, the company will run without us here, uh, myself included. I, I totally agree with that. And I, I feel like some of the, the leaders, even fast growing companies, I, I, I just really, I talked to someone the other day that they were, you know, working at midnight and all hours of the night because they had to get these little elements done. And I'm sitting back thinking, that means you're the bottleneck. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And I want to leave on this note, like this whole aspect of meeting with agile, you've got a lot of meetings, all hands. We have two, one on Monday, one on Friday, you have team agile meetings. You have the meetings that happen before you start sprints and, and at the end of sprints. Um, what, what mistakes or what kind of boundaries have you put around these meetings that make them run efficiently? Uh, so one one of the rules, uh, meetings start and end on time. So I, I don't think you can have uh, this kind of uh, methodology if you're going to allow your your meetings to run even an extra minute, right? If you think about how important every minute is. So uh, everything has to start and end on time. We actually have a standing rule. So for a, uh, a one-hour meeting, if you're more than five minutes late, uh, the organizer of the meeting is allowed to tell you not to show up, or if you do try to walk in to send you out of uh, without that being a weird cultural thing. Uh, on a half hour meeting is three minutes. So you have three minutes, uh, you know, think about that, right? So if you're more than three minutes late, you're only going to have 27 minutes left in the half hour meeting. So it's, it's very important that the meetings begin and end on time. Another uh, rule is uh, if, if a meeting is no longer useful to you, uh, basically you're uh, culturally allowed to stand up and walk out and, uh, and or to, for the host of the meeting to decide at all times whether or not the people in the room are valuable for the meeting. But uh, yes, meetings are, uh, I think, something that, uh, that everyone's terrified of. Certainly my first company, we're like, we're never gonna have a meeting again. <laughs> that didn't work well, actually. I can, I can report back. I slept on my <laughs> desk three out of five nights a week, actually face down on my keyboard because mm -hmm. I thought you're not hardcore enough if you're sleeping under your desk. And yeah. <laughs> no, what I'll tell you from that is, um, we, we work a much more balanced work week here at Skills with much greater uh, productivity and results. And, and it's so much more, results uh, are really a, a generation out of productivity. And productivity is not about how many hours you show up to, to work, it's about how many productive hours were you in, you know, were you working? And I, I think that's one of the like really fundamental shifts of how to build a great company. It's, how are you focused on productivity? How are you focused for your point earlier on, are you walking in the right direction? As opposed to saying, hey man, I'm gonna just start sprinting. It's like, what? Well, you may not want to sprint because you may be going backwards. Yeah. <laughs> you're, running, you're running away from your goal. You're running <laughs> literally as fast as you can away from your goal. <laughs> and so I, I think, I can't say enough, really thinking much more about, uh, you know, almost the analogy of you are navigating a boat in unknown water and you need to think all the time, am I heading on the right bearing? And if I'm heading on the right bearing, like, hey, are, you know, what level of speed should I be trying to put in my sails and my rowing of my boat? Um, I, I like to think a lot about these like pirates, like sort of ship analogies. Uh, I think there are all kinds of different fun ones for entrepreneurs, but I, I feel like uncharted territory is a lot of what being an entrepreneur is all about. Well, one last question as we wrap up today's interview. Uh, what mistake uh, did you make that you had to really shift your style of leadership uh, in order to continue the growth of the company? So, uh, so company one, uh, I think I mentioned, I, I slept at the office uh, multiple nights a week and I, I can only imagine those poor employees who come in and they would see me in the same shirt multiple day after, like day after day. And that this, you know, 24 year old uh, is the CEO of the company. He's sleeping, you know, like literally on his desk, waking up having like keyboard marks on, on his face. Um, that was not a very effective way to work. Uh, company two, uh, I worked every day uh, of the week in the office, at least 12 hours a day. Um, so can I calculate that out? Seven days a week, it's 96 hours a week. 
Um, again, I don't think that was the most effective uh, way to work. I think one of my greatest uh, personal failures was not appreciating that, um, how important balance and how letting everything in your life have its place is to being productive. Uh, so actually our seventh value at skills, our seventh and final value is balance. Uh, and it is just that, letting everything in your life have its place. And that realizing that sleeping at night in your bed is uh, as important to the eventual victory of skills as the hard, uh, you know, the hard labor in the office itself. Fantastic. Well, it's a good place to end. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your insights here with the Gro uh, Growth Think Tank. Um, where can our audience get in touch with you and just like follow along with what Skills is doing next? Sure. So skills.com um, or our Twitter, Skills, uh, is a great way to watch. We, uh, we post uh, most fun things to Twitter and or to our uh, other avenues on social media. But it's all just Skills with a Z. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Wow. That's really fantastic to have that kind of conversation with someone growing that fast. Andrew's got a special talent for seeing opportunity inside of a market and being able to align a team to execute around that. And that's the reason why I have interviews like this on growththinktank.com. So if you have uh, questions or you want to know how you could grow like this, then make sure you reach out to me. I'd love to get to know you. If you appreciate what we're doing here, you know someone that would really be great for this uh, show that you want to introduce them to it, make sure you share it with the growththinktank.com. It's not about vanity numbers. I don't need to, uh, you know, just anybody listening. I want the right people that want to grow fast, become the kind of leaders that really invest in themselves, invest in their people. And that's what this is all about. So as always, lead with courage. And I'll see you next time.